Here is another video you might find helpful about how house framing can be a rewarding but challenging project for do-it-yourselfers who aren't fully prepared and while it may seem like you're just nailing a few boards together, it's usually much more like a complicated structural system that requires precision and an understanding of how forces are distributed. Mistakes made here can be costly and difficult to fix later. Here are the top 5 house framing mistakes made by do-it-yourselfers, from the most common and easily made to the most structurally significant and dangerous. 1. Ignoring, plumb, level, and square. This is the most fundamental and frequent mistake. It's a failure to ensure that walls are perfectly vertical or plumb, floors and plates are perfectly horizontal and level, and all corners are at perfect 90-degree angles and square. Why it happens, rushing, using a short or inaccurate level, a two-foot level is not sufficient for plumbing a wall, or not knowing how to properly check for square across large dimensions. The consequences, this mistake creates a domino effect of problems. Drywall will be difficult to hang and finish, cabinets won't sit flush against the wall, trim and molding will have unsightly gaps, doors won't close properly, and flooring installation becomes a nightmare. How to avoid it? Plum, use a high-quality 4-foot or 10-foot level to check walls for plum after they are raised. Check both the face and the edge of the end studs. Level, ensure your bottom plate is perfectly level before you begin. Use shims if necessary to correct an uneven subfloor. Square, before you raise a wall, check it to make sure it's square while it's on the floor. Measure the diagonals of the rectangle and if the measurements are identical, the wall is square. You can use the same method for floors, roofs and window openings. 2. Undersized or improperly supported headers. Headers are the beams that span openings for windows and doors. Their job is to carry the vertical load from the roof and floors above and transfer it down to the foundation. Why it happens, DIYers often underestimate the load a header must carry. They might guess at the size, use a single 2 by 6 where a double 2 times 10 is required, or neglect to provide proper support. The consequences, a weak header will sag over time, causing the wall to bow, creating cracks in the drywall above the opening, and making windows and doors difficult to open and close. In a worst-case scenario, it can lead to structural failure. How to avoid it? Consult span tables and never guess. Your local building code provides specific tables that dictate the required header size based on the width of the opening and the load it carries, but sometimes you will need to contact an engineer when dealing with large or multi-story structures. Proper construction, headers are typically made of two boards with a spacer of plywood or OSB in between to make the header the same thickness as a 2x4 wall or it can be a solid piece of lumber like a 4x8 or 4x12. Full support, the header must be supported at each end by one or more jack studs that transfers the load directly to the bottom plate and the floor structure below. Three. Incorrect stud layout or on center spacing. Standard framing practice spaces studs at 16 inches or 24 inches on center, OC. This is done for both structural reasons and to accommodate standard 4 foot by 8 foot sheathing and drywall panels. Why it happens, inaccurate measuring, forgetting to account for the thickness of the stud itself, or starting the layout from the wrong point. A common error is measuring 16 inches and placing the center of the stud there when the layout mark should represent the edge. The consequences, if the layout is off, the edges of your plywood sheathing or drywall panels will not land on the center of a stud. This forces you to cut every single sheet, wasting time and material, and results in poorly supported drywall seams that are prone to cracking. How to avoid it? Mark the top and bottom plates at the same time for consistency. Pull your tape from one end and mark at 15 and one quarter of an inch for your first stud. This ensures that the center of that first stud is at 16 inches and then continue marking every 16 inches from there. Use a layout T or a speed square to draw your lines and place an X on the side of the line where the stud should go. 4. Improper fastening. The type, size, and number of fasteners used to connect framing members are critical for the structure's strength and safety. Why it happens, assuming that any screw will work or you can use any nail when you can't. Many DIYers mistakenly use deck screws or drywall screws for structural connections because they are convenient and pull wood together tightly. The consequences, drywall and deck screws are brittle and can snap under the sheer forces that framing connections experience especially from wind or seismic activity. 
Using too few nails or nails that are too small creates a weak joint that can pull apart. This is a hidden danger that compromises the entire integrity of the building. How to avoid it? Use the right fastener and never use drywall or deck screws for structural framing. Use hot-dipped galvanized or stainless steel framing nails appropriate for the job like 16D for joining plates and 8D for sheathing three-quarters of an inch or less in width. Follow nailing schedules and building codes to specify exactly how many nails of a certain size are required for every type of connection and follow these schedules. A pneumatic framing nailer is a worthwhile investment or rental for this. 5. Disregarding the load path. This is a more conceptual mistake that underlies many others. It is the failure to understand that a structure is a complete system designed to transfer loads from the very top like the roof to flow continuously down to the very bottom of the foundation. Why it happens, it comes from not constantly asking the question, what is supporting this, and what will this support? Framing isn't just about putting up walls, it's about stacking structural pieces directly on top of each other. Rafters should sit on studs, and studs should sit on joists or foundation walls below. When they don't line up, you create a weak link in the chain, forcing weight onto parts of the frame that were never meant to carry it. The consequences, this creates stress points where loads are not properly supported. Floors may feel bouncy or sag, walls can bow, and the entire structure settles unevenly. Cutting through a floor joist to run plumbing without properly heading it off is a classic example of interrupting the load path. How to avoid it? Think vertically and always visualize how the weight is being transferred downwards. Rafters could land directly over wall studs. Floor joists should be stacked directly over the studs on the wall below them. Respect continuity, anytime you must cut or interrupt a structural member like a stud for a window or a joist for a staircase the load it was carrying must be redirected through headers, trimmers, and other supports to an adjacent member, preserving the continuous path to the foundation. When in doubt, it's always better to overbuild than to underbuild. And as always, thanks for watching and I hope you learned at least one thing from our video. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, let us know by hitting the thumbs up button or letting us know in the comment area.